Hi, my name is Dr. Yasser al Humayri, and today I'll be performing the cardiovascular examination. As with all other examinations, you should start by introducing yourself, explaining your role and the nature of the examination to the patient, then take consent and ensure privacy. Hi, my name is Dr. Yasser, I am a general practitioner and today I'll be examining your heart, which will include me looking, feeling and listening to your chest and back. Is that okay with you? Yes, it's okay. Be sure that no one will be entering or leaving the examination room during the examination. Okay. Now, as with all other examinations, we go for HIPAA. H stands for hand washing, E for the exposure of the patient, and here we need to expose the chest and neck, position which is 45 degrees, then appearance, the patient looks well, he is not in acute distress, then check for signs of shortness of breath, muscle wasting, attached monitoring devices, oxygen mask, and IV cannula. You should always check the vitals after the general inspection. Next is the inspection of the hands. Starting with the nails, we have one abnormal shape and three abnormal colors. The shape is clubbing and the colors we have splinter hemorrhages, tar stains and peripheral cyanosis. In the palms, we look for Osler's nodes which are painful and Janway legions which are painless and both are signs of infective endocarditis. In the dorsum of the hands we check the temperature and tendon xanthoma. Next is checking the radial pulse. You should wait for 15 seconds and multiply by 4 or for 30 seconds and multiply by 2. Then comment on the rate, rhythm, volume and character. In the character you have three things to consider. First, radio radial equality. You check the radial pulse of both hands and they should occur at the same time. Next character is radiofemoral delay, which is in case of correctation of the aorta. You check the radial pulse and femoral pulse together. The third character is the collapsing pulse, which is in case of aortic regurgitation. You palpate the radial pulse and hold the patient's hand with your other hand. Do you have pain in your shoulder? No. Raise the patient's hand. Normally there shouldn't be any change, but in case of aortic regurgitation, the radial pulse will be weaker and you will feel the backflow of blood with your other hand. At this point you need to check the blood pressure and check the arms for any bruises in case of using the anticoagulation therapy. Moving to the head, ask the patient to look up, looking for pallor, ask the patient to look down, looking for jaundice, and in the middle, for corneal arcus, and around the eyes, for xanthalisma. Then, look for mitral facies, and then inside the mouth, can you open your mouth? Look for central cyanosis, dental hygiene, and high arc palate. Moving down to the neck, we need to check for two things. First is the carotid pulse. The second thing to look for in the neck is jugular venous pressure. Ask the patient to turn his head slightly to the left. Then try to identify the highest point of pulsation and measure the pressure from there. If you couldn't find the highest point, you can press on the patient's abdomen, which is called hepatojugular reflex. Then it will be more evident. Then place a ruler on the sternal angle and measure the height of the highest point of pulsation of internal jugular vein. Normally it should be less than 3 to 4 centimeters. Next is the chest inspection. Look for SSPP, scars, skeletal deformities, pulsations that are visible and pacemaker. This is the end of the inspection part. Next is the palpation. First, locate the apex beat. Then check the position. 
So it is in the fifth intercostal space, midclavicular line. So normal position and normal character. The characters here are heaving in case of pressure overload, thrusting in case of volume overload, and tapping in case of mitral stenosis. The second thing to check for is left parasternal impulse using the palm. Usually it should be weak. If strong, then it might indicate right ventricular hypertrophy with a pressure overload. Third, you need to check for thrill, which is a palpable murmur in case of severe pulmonary stenosis or aortic stenosis. Next is the auscultation part. While auscultating the heart, make sure to time S1 and S2 by placing your index and middle finger on the carotid artery on the lower third of the neck. S1 is just before the carotid upstroke and S2 is just after the carotid upstroke. First, we start with the basic auscultation using the bell on the mitral area. Then, we move to the diaphragm again on the mitral area. Then, tricuspid area, pulmonary area, and aortic area. Next is the advanced auscultation. We use it for a better auscultation in case we hear a murmur. We start with the bell and we place it on the mitral area and ask the patient to turn on his side. Then take a, take a breath in and out. Hold. Next, place the diaphragm on the axilla while the patient is sitting normally. Next, place the diaphragm on the tricuspid area and ask the patient to lean forward. Take a breath in and out. Hold. Next, place the diaphragm over the carotids. And last, place the bell over the carotids. Now we move to the back, ask the patient to sit on the edge of the bed and start with the inspection. Look for scars and skeletal deformities. Then check for pitting edema. Then percuss on the base of the lung. Normally it should be resonant. If dull, it might indicate pleural effusion secondary to right heart failure. Then, auscultate the base of the lung using the diaphragm. So, there are no crackles or crepitations. If present, they might indicate pulmonary edema secondary to left heart failure. Now, to end our examination, we should perform the abdominal examination checking for hepatosplenomegaly, ascites, renal and aortic bruise. Then, check the lower limb for Normal hair distribution, normal skin, pitting edema, and assess the dorsalis pedis pulse and posterior tibial pulse.